On the 22nd of March 1999, a terrified woman ran through the streets of New Mexico, naked. She'd escaped after being held captive by sadistic sexual torturer David Parker Ray. She wasn't his only victim. I was scared. I didn't know if he was going to kill me or not. He could get a woman in virtually any position. She was his sex slave. More than 30 women had passed through Parker Ray's torture chamber. The police suspected that many of them had been murdered. I've never had any question that David Parker Ray uh, is a serial killer. The police launched a vast search for bodies, but Parker Ray was always one step ahead. David was a very intelligent individual and took great lengths to make sure that he was not discovered. Could one of America's most prolific serial killers get away with murder? New Mexico, a barren land with the second highest murder rate in America. Cut off from the world by 40,000 square miles of desert, Truth or Consequences is a town where people go about their business and few questions are asked. Population 6,000 and falling. Truth or Consequences has kind of an undercurrent of criminal activity. We investigated a murder where a guy was stabbed 43 times. We had another murder where a guy beat his wife and put her in the trunk of the car and burned her in the car. Then there was a man found dead in his apartment. He had um, blue panties on and no other clothes. Uh, he had a doorknob inserted in his rectum. Um, this is just a community where strange and bizarre crimes occur. On the 22nd of March 1999, the police received a call that would open a case far more shocking than anything they'd seen before. The call came from a panicked local after 21-year-old Cynthia Verheel burst into her house. She was naked except for a metal dog collar attached to a six-foot chain. So the officers arrive on the scene. Cynthia V. Hills telling them, don't let them get me. They, they kidnap me. They uh, tied me up. They raped me. The officers, of course, you know, who and where and all these questions are coming up in their minds and uh, sometimes it's really difficult to get uh, answers from a frantic person. Cynthia Verheel was a prostitute with a heroin addiction. She said she was abducted by a client and driven to a house on the outskirts of truth or consequences. As far as when a police officer is called to an incident involving a prostitute, that's always in the officer's mind is, what degree of credibility do I give this lady? Especially if it's a real bizarre story. The house belonged to David Parker Ray, a 59-year-old mechanic. Cynthia said that she was on a bed in a kind of an expanded trailer house. She was naked. Uh, she was handcuffed and she had a, a collar around her neck w which was attached to a pole. Uh, she was given a bucket uh, for a toilet. Um, she was sexually assaulted. She was uh, repeatedly sexually assaulted. She was under the impression she was going to be killed. So she was desperate to, to get out. Cynthia V. Hill said that she was held in this house for three days. On the third day, Cynthia Hill said that a fight ensued. A lamp was broken. Cynthia Hill then was able to escape out the back door of this residence. Parker Ray was arrested. The police obtained a search warrant for his house to investigate the prostitute's allegations.
Once they go inside the house, they find where Cynthia had been held uh, in the sunken uh, living room area. They see the bed, they see the pole, the, there's some chains and manacles there. There's a bucket with her waist on the floor. There was obvious signs of a struggle and disarray in the room. Obviously, what they saw did not look like the area of somebody who had been kept there voluntarily. The search team also found a collection of sinister sexual devices. Everything that they were seeing did nothing for them except to add evidence and, and corroboration to what Cynthia, their victim, was telling them. But nothing could prepare them for what they would find inside a simple white trailer at the side of Parker Ray's house. It wasn't really until the utility trailer was open that we really began to get a good understanding of what we were potentially dealing with. Then Pandora's box was opened. In the desert town of truth or consequences, prostitute Cynthia Verheel was recovering in hospital. She had escaped from three days of sexual torture at the hands of David Parker Ray. Parker Ray had been arrested. He was a 59-year-old mechanic and a father of two. Go and state your name for the record, David Ray. David Parker Ray. He claimed that the prostitute had agreed to a session of rough bondage. Was, that, was she a willing participant, or yes. did she not want to do it? She was willing. Okay. At Parker Ray's house, the police were discovering the horrifying truth. The search team had arrived at a seemingly innocuous white trailer. Pretty, pretty amazing. It was uh, remarkable. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. The first thing my eyes focused on was this black chair, which turned out to be a gynecology chair, uh, just sitting there empty. There was medical equipment and, and everywhere. Drills, modified drills with sexual devices on them and cages. I mean, it was just this unbelievable-looking den. This was a torture chamber. David Parker Ray called the trailer his toy box, or Satan's den. To see it the first time just kind of gave you a feeling of sickness, and it was just remarkable how everything was set up. Everything in here denoted pain. Everything in here denoted destruction. There were several, several items in there that were obviously meticulously crafted by hand and were very, very sinister. David was known as very adept with his hands, as, a, as an excellent mechanic. By day, Parker Ray worked for the local state park. And this is David's truck right here, his original truck. He was well respected for his technical ability. To those who knew him, he was not the kind of man who tortured women in his spare time. Ah, he was just a real nice guy. He was just uh, real nice, real smart. He was always eager to, to help these other guys do things, you know, around here. And these are some things that he made. He named them snake catchers. That's a rope through a piece of pipe. It's a snake in there. It's a pretty creative piece of work he did there. Then he had the ankle spreader. This looks like something that he would have made. Um, 
and he has it labeled ankle spreader. He could get a woman in virtually any position that he wanted her in. She was his sex slave uh, when they entered this, this trailer. And then he had the dildo fashioned out of, uh, looks like a plastic pipe actually. These are nails that have been uh, melted into this plastic collar and this would be inserted in her vagina or anal canal. And he would work it and work it until um, he could get it all the way in and then they would have these spikes here. They're going to go in, you're, you're going to get poked, it's going to be very painful and rip their inner thighs out. I have to wonder how many people uh, came in contact with all this stuff. Parker Ray's terrifying den was evidence of a long campaign of sexual torture. The consensus was pretty clear that there were going to be additional victims here. For example, the utility trailer was taken apart virtually and we collected trinkets, rings, necklaces, jewelry. They came from somebody. Despite police appeals for more women to come forward, Cynthia was still the only known victim. But as a prostitute and drug addict, she might not be believed in court. The police needed more credible witnesses. Inside the toy box, Parker Ray had set up two video cameras. The suspicion was that he had recorded the suffering of his captives. It made sense to believe and was logical to deduce that there were videotapes somewhere. And many, many were found. There were probably a hundred, at least a hundred. Most of the tapes contained nothing of relevance, but one would prove explosive. It showed Parker Ray testing his equipment. Then it cut. And when it came back to life, Parker Ray was with a captive. It's what you see here is the inside of the toy box. You see a youngish, blonde-haired woman with David strapped down naked. He's standing over top of her or kneeling next to her at all times. He's constantly touching her, and it's obvious that he's trying to get some kind of sexual gratification out of this. She appeared to be unconscious or at least unresponsive to anything he was doing to her. Um, this hasn't had any of the earmarks of a consensual encounter uh, between two people who just enjoy this kind of behavior. The videotape was crucial evidence of another victim, but who she was was a mystery. We're looking at this videotape and, and we need to know who this person is. He moves her leg at one point and what's exposed on her right calf, on the outside of her right calf, is a tattoo. And you can see it in the video, but it's not clear. And it looks like a pretty, you know, it looked like a pretty big tattoo. So we took this tape to the FBI to have it enhanced. Once the image was enhanced, we provided that to the media. Very shortly afterwards, a woman came forward and said, that's my tattoo, uh, that's me. That tattoo I have is unique. Nobody else has it. Kelly Van Cleve was a 25-year-old childminder. She was a friend of Parker Ray's daughter, but had no recollection of ever going to his house, and no idea why the FBI had a picture of her tattoo. They told me that it came off of a, a video they found in David's house, toy box, as they called it. It was weird, and I was scared. Initially, it was clear that 
she was having difficulty remembering everything that had happened to her in the utility trailer and in her experience with David. Before the FBI contacted me, I used to have nightmares of being tied to a table or handcuffs or duct tape scared me. But I could never put any of it together. And then when the FBI called, then I knew they weren't just dreams, nightmares, they were real. Kelly was struggling to remember the details of what Parker Ray had done to her. But the police had made a chilling discovery in Parker Ray's house, which would explain everything. A tape recording in his own voice that he played to initiate his victims. Hello there, bitch. I'm going to tell you in detail why you have been kidnapped, what's going to happen to you. This was sinister stuff. Now, you are obviously here against your will. You're going to be kept chained in a variety of different positions, usually with your legs or knees forced wide apart. You'll be raped thoroughly and repeatedly in every hole you've got. <laughs> Midway through, the tape revealed that Kelly's memory loss may have been no accident. You're going to be drugged up real heavy with a combination of sodium pentothal and phenobarbital. You're not going to remember a fucking thing about this little adventure or what has happened to you. Sodium pentothal and phenobarbital numb pain and induce amnesia. It seemed Parker Ray was using drugs to control his victims and ensure they would not remember his crimes. Maybe it explains some of the things that were done to me. Being tied down and how uncomfortable you're going to feel and being used as a sex slave. Parker Ray released Kelly three days after taking her captive, confident that she would never remember her ordeal. But as the police questioned her, memories started to surface. Over time, she was able to piece together elements of her captivity in the toy box. I didn't know how long I had been there. I could see under the duct tape once in a while. Had all kinds of sex devices and whips and chains and stuff. I remember him coming and going several times, but I don't know how many times. When he was in there, he was in there for a long time. I was scared. I remember telling him that I wanted to go home. I didn't know if he was going to kill me or not. I don't ever remember drinking or eating anything. He um, let me up to use a porta pot once, but I was shackled to do that. I remember him using different kinds of toys on me. And they hurt. That's about all I remember. The police now had a credible witness but not necessarily one who could get Parker Ray behind bars. Potential weakness that she had, she didn't remember certain things. She didn't have a clear recollection of others. And that weakens the case and the overall picture that the jury is going to be given of exactly what David was up to. The prosecution needed more, and by Parker Ray's own admission, there were many more victims to find. In his tape recordings, he indicated that he had been involved in sexual assault since he was 15. David was arrested when he was 59. So he has approximately 44 years of practice. As of the time this tape was made, I've taken 37 women for these purposes. Hell, maybe more by now. With so many victims unaccounted for, there was a fear that Parker Ray was more than a sadistic torturer. He could be a prolific serial killer. 
that you are expendable. It may sound harsh and cold, but I won't have any qualms at all about slicing your throat. If you believe what David says on the tape is true, that he rapes and tortures women, there's no reason not to believe the other parts about killing women and disposing of their bodies is also true. Death was a constantly resurfacing uh, idea from David, not from us, but from David in his writings and his drawings and his tapes. Everything revolved around death. I've never had any question that David Parker Ray uh, is a serial killer. There's never been a doubt in my mind about it. Whether the case was going to be a murder trial would depend on whether we could link David to the actual killing of victims. If Parker Ray was a serial killer, he lived in the perfect place to hide the bodies. His house was on the shores of Elephant Butte Lake. At 43 miles long and 200 feet deep, it's the largest body of water in New Mexico. There was a map that we recovered in David Parker Ray's house that was just a map of the lake with X's on it. David had a sailboat, a large skiff sailing boat with depth finding equipment, and he knew that lake very, very well, and he knew where the deepest places in that lake were. I was hoping that we were going to have a body. I was praying that we were going to have a body. There were overall like, between two and three full dive missions that were performed there without being able to locate uh, any evidence that we could connect definitively to the Parker Ray investigation. David had the perfect job if he wants to hide bodies or whatever. He had access to every nook and cranny of Elephant Butte State Park. He had access to areas that are kept under lock and key that keep the public away from, but to which he had access. We searched caves, holes in the ground, wells, mines, lakes. We searched everywhere we could possibly think. It was endlessly frustrating. The case against Parker Ray was weak. The best witness had a patchy memory, and unless bodies could be found, there was a chance that a murderer would walk free. He was an intelligent man and capable of going the extra mile and making an extra effort, especially when it came to this kind of behavior, to do what he needed to do to avoid detection, and I believe that's what he did. But Parker Ray hadn't thought of everything. An extraordinary confession from one of his acquaintances was about to blow the investigation wide open. Police believed that victims of David Parker Ray's campaign of sexual torture were buried in the New Mexico desert. But no bodies had been discovered and the case against him was on rocky ground. The only known surviving victims were a heroin-addicted prostitute and a woman whose memory of her captivity had been scrambled by Parker Ray's cocktail of drugs. But Kelly Van Cleve clearly remembered what happened before she was drugged. In July 1996, she was abducted from this once bustling bar on the outskirts of Truth or Consequences. We rounded up a bunch of friends and went bar hopping. And this is where we ended up. We always ended up here. No matter where we started, this is where we quit. There used to be a little mini bar sitting here. Pool tables right there. And we were playing pool and I had ordered a beer. And I left to take one of my drunk friends home. And came back and some of my other friends left. And at the end of the evening, it was just me and Jesse. Jessie Ray, David's daughter. Jessie agreed to give Kelly a lift home, but she drove straight to her father's house. 
The fact that it was his own daughter kidnapping just shows the depth of his resolve when it came to this behavior and, uh, and also showed his lack of emotional involvement with just about anybody or anything. I just remember being on her couch, her dad's couch. That's when they held the knife to my throat and put the dog collar on, the duct tape, the handcuffs. And I ended up tied to a table. Jesse, you have anything to say this morning? Jesse Ray was arrested for her role in Kelly's abduction. Are you optimistic that you'll be out soon? Yeah. It wasn't the only time she'd taken someone home to meet her father. In July 1997, one year after Kelly's abduction, a friend of hers had gone missing from the same bar. Marie Parker was a 21-year-old mother of two. It was almost midnight. She said she was going to go home and check on her kids. She'd be right back. By the time the bar closed at 2 o'clock, she still wasn't there and her car was still there. So, But somebody said Jesse followed Marie out. No one has heard from Marie Parker since that night. She had two little girls. There was no way she was going to leave her kids. So I knew something had happened. The similarities between Kelly's abduction and Marie's disappearance seemed unlikely to be coincidence. You ever heard of a woman named Marie Parker? Not really, no. She's a woman that uh, disappeared about two years ago. And I just thought I'd ask, you know, I said that I'd to you, I'd ask to see if you had any information that you could provide me with that. You know, with Marie Parker, we knew he was involved, but we, we didn't have enough information or evidence to, to pin anything on him. She's the one that disappeared from one of the bars? Yes, sir. Okay. I don't think about that. I know of the incident, that's all. You were a part of that, by chance? No, certainly not. Okay. On the night Marie disappeared, Jesse Ray had been at the bar with a friend of her father's called Roy Yancey. The police suspected he was an accomplice and brought him in for questioning. His statement was astonishing. Uh, from what I understand is that he's had many years of kidnapping, torturing and killing women. The story that Roy gave was that Marie Parker had in fact been a victim of David Parker Ray, that she had been abducted while she was in the toy box. She was systematically tortured over a period of a, a couple of days. Uh, when she wasn't being tortured, she was placed on a cot and slid underneath uh, a part of the, the, uh, the wall in the toy box that they could shut and lock. Uh, and at the end of all of this, uh, the information that Roy Yancey gave us was that he was instructed to kill Marie Parker by strangulation. How did you come up with the idea to, to kill Marie? Uh, that was David Ray Parker's idea. That's pretty remarkable. It just seemed like it went up to a different level, and each level it went up to it became more overwhelming. And then I began to wonder, you know, where is it going to end? I know they ended up giving me a rope and telling me to, to strangle her. And she wasn't dying fast enough. Okay, but you said she wasn't dying fast enough. Was she struggling or? Yeah, she was struggling. We have no doubt that his statement was accurate. His details were such that uh, it's unquestionable that Roy Yancey killed Marie Parker. I was told not to tell anybody anything or I was going to be killed and thrown in the ditch. And who told you that? How did it? If Roy Yancey could take the police to Marie Parker's body, they'd finally have the evidence to link Parker Ray to murder. David and Roy, according to Roy Yancey, took the body out to a remote location in the desert, rolled it down a ravine, covered it up with a little bit of dirt, and then drove back. And Roy was very specific and detailed about the location where this happened. He remembered, he said, pretty well where this was. We felt that if we were able to locate this body, it was going to be a domino effect, and, and soon this was going to lead to more and more and more. We spent the better part of a week with Roy Yancey going to several different locations. We had 
40 people out looking in these areas. We had helicopters out looking in these areas, and still we, we weren't able to recover a body. And Roy's, I guess, hypothesis, which seems to be credible and makes sense, is that David returned to that location after the body had been disposed of and relocated it. Yet again, David Parker Ray had been meticulous in avoiding detection. We spent a great deal of time chasing an intelligent man who was well versed in what he was doing and, and certainly able to cover his tracks very effectively. We were always one step behind him. There's thousands upon thousands of deep narrow ravines, nooks and crannies and where do you look? We could be standing above her right now and never know it. And I often wonder how close did we actually come to, to her or some of the victims during the course of this. Roy Yancey pleaded guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to 20 years. But David Parker Ray maintained his innocence and without Marie Parker's body, murder charges could not be brought against him. It's extremely frustrating to know that he's committed murders and yet not have sufficient evidence to bring this matter to a resolution in a court of law. But the fact that we couldn't prosecute him for murder made it all the more important that we successfully prosecute him for the rape, tortures and kidnappings that we could prove in court that he did. The trial of David Parker Ray began on the 29th of June 2000. His fate now lay entirely in the hands of Kelly Van Cleve. Despite her patchy memory, she would have to convince a jury that he had kidnapped and sexually tortured her. I didn't want to go to court. I didn't want to have to go face him. But I did it. He couldn't be out on the streets any longer. I had to do it. Because I had to do what I could to save other women. As Kelly took the stand, Parker Ray was just feet away. It was the first time she'd seen him since her captivity. He was just sitting there with a smug look on his face. And it pissed me off. He acted like he was totally innocent and he had done nothing wrong. I didn't want to cry and let him know how much he hurt me. I didn't want to be his victim. That was difficult. Kelly explained what she could of her ordeal in the toy box, but under cross-examination, she was attacked rigorously. The defense point of view has to be in this case that she's not a credible witness and therefore should not be believed because she couldn't remember what happened. You sit up there on the stand and wonder, are these guys going to believe me? David's story was that she came over quite willingly, that they had some beers, and that uh, she had consensual sex, uh, that the, the sex became kinkier as she stayed longer, and that uh, he uh, cleaned her up and sent her home at the end of it. Just lies. I think that was the most difficult part, was all the lies that they said. I could have faced David without the lies. People often do things that they can't live with. And so they have to change the way they feel about what happened, or the way they report what happened, or the way they feel about themselves to account for that behavior. Uh. The defense's claims that Kelly had consented to be in the toy box were contradicted by Parker Ray himself on the initiation tape that he played his victims. You are obviously here against your will. You'll be raped thoroughly and repeatedly in every hole you've got. But there was a problem. Kelly could not remember if Parker Ray had played the tape to her, so the judge ruled it was not relevant. The jury was not allowed to hear it. The suppression of the audio tape weakened our case because they were not able to hear David's 
actual planning, preparation, and his own voice. They're going to be kept like an animal. As far as I'm concerned, you're a pretty piece of meat. Your pussy and asshole is going to get a real workout. This was essentially a confession. The prosecution did have one more weapon to draw on. The video footage of Parker Ray torturing Kelly in the toy box. When you look at the tape, you see that there's no evidence of injury because he's not beating her. He's touching her gently. He caresses her breasts. He lightly rubs her stomach. He uh, lightly rubs her arms. She was able to sit there and loosen up her joints and the, the way you would if you'd done something strenuous. And uh, that was our interpretation of the tape. I knew the defense was going to try to turn everything around on me. But I didn't think that with the tape, I figured everybody would know. Everybody could see I wasn't there willingly. After a two-week trial, the jury retired to consider whether Kelly's testimony was enough to lock up Parker Ray for life. Kelly's the one who the jury has to believe in order for them to return a guilty verdict. I didn't think there was going to be any way that a jury would come back with a not guilty verdict in this. When they finally made a decision and everybody got back to the courtroom, I knew it was going to be a guilty verdict. It had to have been a guilty verdict. They fooled me. The judge required a unanimous decision, and on July the 13th, 2000, the jury announced their verdict. Some jurors did not believe Kelly's testimony, so Parker Ray could not be convicted. It was a hung jury. When they came back with a hung jury verdict, I about fainted, literally. I didn't understand it. The decision was made to retry the case, this time with a different jury and a different judge. I didn't want to go through court again. But I had to. He was not going to hurt anybody else. Nine months after the first trial ended, the retrial got underway. In a boost to the prosecution, the new judge decided that Parker Ray's initiation tape was relevant to the case and allowed it to be heard. Parker Ray's voice filled the courtroom. Hello there, bitch. You probably think you're going to be raped, and you're fucking sure right about that. I remember hearing his voice, and it sent shivers down my spine. You're not going to remember a fucking thing about this little adventure. It was like you could cut through the air with a knife. As far as I'm concerned, you're a pretty piece of meat. Be smart and be a survivor. Have a nice day. The audio tape was a crucial piece of evidence, but everything rested on Kelly's testimony. For Parker Ray to be found guilty, Kelly would have to take the stand once again and convince the entire jury that she had been kidnapped and tortured. I was vulnerable. I was scared. But I was angry that he got away with the first one. Was he going to get away with the second one? The police believe that David Parker Ray was a serial killer, but as no bodies had been found, he couldn't be charged with murder. Instead, he had been tried for the kidnap, rape and torture of Kelly Van Cleve. But at the first trial, the jury had been unable to agree unanimously that he was guilty. At the retrial, once again, everything rested on Kelly. Unless her testimony was believed by the entire jury, the charges against Parker Ray could be dropped. It's very difficult to tell people you don't know intimate things, 
sexual things about your life. We tested her credibility in the fire of cross-examination and trial twice. Her life must have been hell. I think it was harder the second time than it was the first time because I had already been there. I already had to tell my, my story to thousands of people I didn't know. And that first jury didn't believe me. On April the 16th, 2001, after a week-long trial, the jury retired to consider what they'd heard. It took them just five hours to reach a unanimous verdict. I was sweating. I didn't know what they were going to say. I had no idea. We got guilty. And he got 224 years in prison. And then we partied. Do you believe Kelly's version of events was true? Uh, so the question is whether I believe that she was abducted by the Ray family and held captive and, uh, and raped and tortured. Yeah, I believe it. But you're his defense attorney. You seem to be saying that your client is guilty. I do seem to be saying that, don't I? In a deal with the prosecution, David Parker Ray gave up his right to appeal. In return, his daughter Jessie was released without trial for her role in Kelly's abduction. I knew that not everybody I would ever defend would be innocent. I knew that some of the people that I represented would be truly bad people. And I believe that on the spectrum of people who do not belong in society, uh, David Parker Ray is right in there. Was justice done? don't think justice can ever be done in these types of cases. What David did to these women, no amount of punishment to him can take away what those women have to live with. David took too much of me away. I feel like I'm a totally different person. I don't go anywhere. I don't trust anybody. I miss the old me. The one that used to be wild and crazy and sassy and wasn't scared. I would do just about anything to get the old me back. I wish he wouldn't have died. <laughs> I want him alive. I would ask him why. Why me? Why did he take me home? Why didn't he kill me? I wish he was still alive so he could tell us what happened to all those other girls. Where he buried them. How he killed them so those other families could have some closure. Next on 5, Fred and Rose, The West Murders, continues.